be okay. <coughs> just to get into the management, hopefully. And, um, it's, it's very quick. So kind of like you have that, you have identified somebody, you got some clues, you got some red flags about somebody. So what is that? Um, you need to ask the question. Don't shy away from asking the question, do you have this, do you have that? And it's really some kind of like sincere um, discussion with the team. I mean, like, just let them know, it's out of concern, I've noticed that. Reflect to them why, tell them why you are asking them that. I've noticed that this is happening. I've noticed over the last few days, this is, you look like this, why did you stop that? Do, do you have any? So once they start that, now keep in mind, they are struggling by themselves. Their goal is not to kill themselves. Their goal is not to hide it. But they don't know any other way because nobody is attentive to them. So all this is just basically awareness and, and raising the question, not just getting worried about it and getting like panic attacks in your own um, office or something while this is brewing, but really address it, confront it, and be sympathetic when you're asking. Um, or share it with, if you're not the parent, share it obviously with the parent. Or if you are a friend, share it with a parent or share it with a professional. If you are a parent and you ask and all that, then get a professional. Get to see if therapy can help with that. Obviously prophylactic as well. If you know they are going through divorce, going through separation, going through all that, then be more attentive. This might be needed. And, and sometimes really the resolution of the conflict of all that which we call sometimes the nucleus. Sometimes the nucleus can create a lot of um, swirling around it of like unending depression that will never end. Needs some kind of a mind switch or he needs to get to know, so what is it? And really being a parent or an adult sometimes helps with that a lot. Seeking help um, and then obviously there is crisis hotline, crisis offices, just to get help from whatever resources, or even at the ER. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, the last one, the ER, that's, I'm gonna show you a slide in a, in a second, but most of the times, that's what we end up. We end up just having cases from the ER. Thankfully, again, they, are, they didn't succeed in whatever amount, but they come from the ER, but that shouldn't be the main source of referral. That shouldn't be, because once you are in the ER, you already attempted or you're already about it, or something major happened. Um, so this is kind of like in therapist act acronym for um, like acknowledge that the depression all that act to be try to be empathetic and voice your concern and then treatment referral to somebody or a therapist or let's go tomorrow to do this let's go um, someplace and we'll talk about different levels of care in a second as well. Um, what not to do, this is important as well because it's, again, it is geared in our own um, dynamics or sometimes by our culture, our, how we've been raised, how we have seen our own parents handle situations. Don't try to just um, cheer them up or kind of like have a laugh out of them because it's very, this is very minimal and very, uh, kind of like you're just scratching the surface. You haven't seen the, the whole mountain underneath that. Um, don't challenge, obviously, that's, that's very bad. We, sometimes girlfriends, unfortunately, or boyfriends do that. That's extremely dangerous. Uh, don't assume situation will take care of itself that, oh, he's gonna get over it. And um, moral issues don't start arguing so they can actually, if he says something or about, okay, what about this and all that, don't, don't start arguing and say, I'm gonna change his mind. No, address it and how this is causing him to change his grades and why this, has caused him. So always pick, anchor yourself with what you have seen with the clues, with the attitudes. So how this is tied to you leaving uh, your sports or not going to the uh, training anymore. How this is tied to um, the change in your, how this is, and not judgmental. Just help me understand why. And if you start saying it, because it doesn't matter. Everything is kind of like useless. Everything that you know, the, the amount of the, what you're dealing with. Don't act shocked oh my God, and all this around. So just try to absorb, because that's what we want. Part of the therapy is identifying with you. So the more empathy you have with them is just basically in a different way. You become them, and they become you. So you need to understand exactly where they at and how that is going. And, and, um, and that's sometimes um, 
painful, but it's part of the process. You just have to and accept and absorb and okay, let's we need tomorrow morning. I'm just gonna call off tomorrow and let's go tomorrow to see this. Let's come tomorrow to do that. Don't don't wait. Don't just do some action. Um, obviously secrecy that's the that's the worst thing as well. If he said I'm gonna tell you but don't tell my parents or don't tell this, can I trust you? Obviously this is all laws and moral and ethics. There is once you are talking about safety of self or others, there is you can violate that by all means, because saving lives overcome anything else. So secrecy, don't don't get into that, and don't risk personal safety. If you feel like they may actually go and do something by the time you tell their parents or anything, just keep an eye on them. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's try to. So don't don't jeopardize safety because we have seen cases that they just oh I was in my way to do this and then. A shotgun was there or something happened so just be uh, attentive um, this is what I told you about the treatment and this is very um, sad graph unfortunately and this is 2016 uh, past year and that was so 2015 from the SAMHSA studies no treatment for 60% they didn't get any treatment for um, uh, adolescents with uh, major depressive episodes, 60%. So more than half of these uh, adolescents with depression, they didn't get any treatment. The number of people who got treatment, medication only, just seeing a primary care pediatrician or a psychiatrist to get medicine, 2%. I mean, like not even seeing the pediatrician. Um, the number for getting health professional and medication, which is therapy and medicine, that's 90%. That's what where we See. So what we are seeing in our hospitals and psychiatric um, treatment and all that, that's that 19%. Health professional only, that's a little bit better. And I think that's more because there's more acceptance to parents um, to take them to therapy than to give them medicine. Any change or any movement is good. There is no right or wrong, really. Therapists are very well equipped and they can refer to uh, a psychiatrist or a, a medication management when it's... Uh, beyond and the same thing if you want to start with the pediatrician and kind of like get them to know or something absolutely fine at least you get some kind of help the worst thing is getting to just doing nothing 60% okay uh, medication that's uh, a little bit tough area I know it's much easier for uh, physicians psychiatrists to actually to to have this high on the list you um, but believe it or not, for adolescents, we are very sensitive to that because um, uh, we, we don't want every adolescent kid to be on medicine. Uh, again, because of the same reason, and even, um, you know, the brain is changing and all this, so you don't want to um, interrupt anything with chemicals, but sometimes it's life-saving. And the um, ABC for medication in adolescents is like the risk and benefit. What is the risk and what is the benefit? If there's a risk of like suicide and depression is not getting better, you've been in treatment or in therapy for two months and the scales of depression, it's still going on and there's still some suicide attempt, something that, I mean, like you have to do something different, right? So you cannot just wait and say, oh, but I'm gonna try another therapist, I'm gonna try. You gotta come to that. And it is scary for parents to actually acknowledge or say, some parents are very, rigid unfortunately about that but sometimes they, they it's kind of like that life-saving I mean same as for adults why people take insulin for um, uh, diabetes why they take lisinopril for high blood pressure why they take medicine for anything so this is like cancer we're talking about by the way second and third leading cause of death in, 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 in adolescents suicide between second or third cancer comes down to that and congenital abnormalities comes down. So if you are gonna have cancer and you're gonna give your kid like, like um, anti-malignancy, um, retroviral, whatever, why this is so much different from depression? Because we are talking about leading cause of death. So it is important. Um, it is not always forever. So the question, are we gonna stay on it forever? No, we're just handling now. Let's get out of the woods. Let's do this for the coming um, few months. Let's get him to be better. And they do get better. And now 
everybody is kind of like, I actually, I'm worried about stopping the medicine once they see the change and all that. Um, this is psychiatric level of care. I mean, like we have in psychiatry um, different levels of care. So obviously when they come to emergency room or there is a high risk, they end up into the inpatient treatment. So which is um, uh, the most higher risk, usually seven to 12 days. Of this. Um, some kids, very chronic, unfortunately, this is not the majority, that they are in and out of the hospital. Really, they cannot stay um, out of the hospital because of the risk of like a lot of things. Could be substance, could be impulsive, could be OCD and conduct and a lot of things. So they, a lot of them may end up doing this, but this is not very rare, but there is places for it, the residential treatment. The most more common thing are the um, outpatient visits that um, whether you are having a psychiatrist, you see them once every few weeks or every few months. Partial hospital is a very good place to start. Partial, that's what I would recommend. Partial is kind of like a midway. You have somebody who is depressed, not really suicidal, start them in partial. Why? Because they're going to see a psychiatrist most probably within 48 hours. They're going to be already involved in treatment. They're going to get into group therapy. They will see other kids. And that makes a huge difference, even more than seeing a therapist adult. Because once they see, like, I'm not the only one there, and I'm starting to see and hear from other kids, they go through the same thing. That's, that creates a lot of relief for them. Okay, now I know there is help. So start with that, and then you can always step down, or step up, so that's why it is in the middle, because if he is above the level of partial hospital, they can admit. So he have access 24 hours with nursing staff, therapist, and all that, the partial program. And it's not inpatient, so he's not spending the night there. Uh, but it is much more than just seeing a psychiatrist once every month, and he will tell you, okay, I'll see you in two weeks, or I'll see you in one month. How do you know how the medicine is gonna work for him for two weeks? Now with all this era of like, all antidepressants can increase the risk of suicide. How are we going to keep an eye on that? He's already having suicide thoughts. So and that's what I'm saying. I, I'm maybe biased about it, but I think partial is a good place to start. Um, and then the community, which is kind of like always you can, in my mind, always you can use that as a step down. They finish like two or three weeks or four weeks, whatever, in partial <coughs> hospital. They can now hand it off to uh, a community uh, mental health or a private therapist or something of that nature. So I hope I kind of covered most of the areas about that. This is some of the resources we got it. And if you have any questions, we got five minutes. Thank you so much for bearing with me all this time. Yes? Um, can this be like family pathology? So that grandpa committed suicide and um, they act it and they see the as a solution to your problem. If you can't manage it yourself, you can always kill yourself. Yes. And I think that this um, sometimes is a bearing on it. There is a very high risk of the um, family genetics about that. Now, speaking about genetics just for mood disorder, I, I would say Bipolar disorder has the most highest genetic loading of all psychiatric issues. I mean, like, it's about 50%. It's almost to the point that if you have diagnosed a bipolar disorder, um, you have to have a first degree relative almost 50% of the time with having bipolar disorder. Very high. Now, depression has a very high risk as well, but not as bipolar, but um, um, it's actually close to 15%. So, but. When, when we do the assessment, there is a family history of the completed suicide or committed suicide. That raised the, the, the risk very high as well. I didn't think of this genetic so much as um, modeling. That well, what was modeled for the child was that this is a solution, whereas in some families, it's definitely unthinkable. Nobody's ever done it. Right, right. So that's, that's the, the debate about nature versus nurture and uh, modeling and learning behavior and all that. Um, Sometimes it is, and sometimes it's genetic. I mean, like, um, if he's already, that's his grandpa or, or his mom did that. I mean, how, how much of that is genetically loaded? And how much he is actually saying, oh, he, he did it right, and he was right. This is my, absolutely. So it could be. Yes? So do you see a rise in, like, the education system being more open and receptive to students talking about this? Because I 
know when I was in high school, we had two students make a pact, and the students talked about it and said this is going to happen, and it was dismissed and ignored, and sure enough, like they both killed themselves. So is that something that? I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of it is um, <coughs> you guys deal with that more than we do. Is kind of like uh, I'm just going to say it. Well, you don't take that. But it, sometimes it's a, a political movement, and who is on the on the highlight of things. So now with the shooting and everything, that becomes the main area. But all that is again part of the mental health well-being of kids in school, and how much we are attentive to that and. Um, I think there is definitely room for more improvement and room for more screening. Um, unfortunately, we're not doing any of that. Unfortunately, most of the time, the school is looking for the um, HMP or the uh, kind of like the, just the annual physical exam and the vaccination and, and just a, a quick um, review of things and all that. And then a lot of what happens during the year just get to be um, ignored and, and not really attended to. And, and parents, they are busy as well. Some, a lot of these kids could be actually, as we talked about, could be single parent as well. That was my question, was what percentage of these kids come from either a situation that are, especially in your facility, because I've talked about some point, where they uh, have, or their parents are either in a divorce, they're in a custody situation, or they're in a single parent home. A big chunk of them, honestly. I mean, like a big part of the numbers of the hospitals, they have very poor family dynamics. And unfortunately, and that's, that's the, 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 the sad part, uh, you try your best, and it's kind of like I'm, I'm fixing you now, but you get back into the same dynamics. And sometimes you know, I mean, we have CPS and everything, but sometimes uh, even CPS say it's unsubstantiated and there's no evidence, and regardless of what the kid is saying, and his only guardian is doing that. and so. It's unfortunate, and, and we are not having, but you deal with what you have, and hopefully you are creating enough coping skills and enough tools or something to stick with the kid until he is actually better. So in our divorce cases, we should probably insist that they have that age group, that they put the kids in some type of counseling. Oh, absolutely. Definitely, oh, definitely. I mean, I do definitely. that, but I mean, definitely. we all should be I doing mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's, any kind of exporter, if you yeah. put that into a system, definitely would, would help. So all our judges should be ordering that if there's mm -hmm. kids in that age group, mm -hmm. that they should be, the parents should have them in some type of counseling. I don't know about that, but. You <laughs> 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 can ask my lawyer. <laughs> 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 yeah, I have one other thing, Dale. I taught this age group for 34 years, and here's what I found. Every people say, why didn't someone notice something? We often did. I can't tell you the couple of times that I saw kids that I thought were suicidal and the parents didn't believe me. They'd say, oh, he's just like Uncle George. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, maybe Uncle George is crazy. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> as a teacher, you see it. You see thousands of kids over the years and those kids stick out like a sore thumb and you know right away right. that something right. is drastically wrong. One girl was hospitalized for suicide ideations and um, eating staples. Oh. And both parents said, you know, they moved on, they got divorced, they had two little kids, two other little kids that they brought to the conference, and she was what we call a throwaway kid. And she knew it. And so, you know, nothing happened, except she got moved out of my classroom so I wouldn't pick on her. Oh. You know, <laughs> and one, one boy did a whole list of people he was going to kill. He wrote wow. a theme about wow. his, an essay about his friends where he would uh, disembowel them and eat their guts and taste it like chicken. Well, I, warning bells are going up in my head, and mom says, yeah, he's just like me, I have this mental issue. But again, he got moved out of my class. Right, right. And that's, and that's what the teacher that's, is That's taught, exactly the point. There is, we try, but... We, we, in, in the family theory as well, it's actually the patient is, it's what we call the identified patient, but he's not really the problem. A lot of the times, it is a family dynamics. Yes. And you've got to look into what is happening behind and what is being fed and what's going on in addition to the genetics and everything. I, I just wanted to comment on your program and what you do. I had a client come to me and bring me a suicide letter from a child. 13 years old, it wasn't an outcry that I'm going to commit suicide. It was a list of all the things she was sorry for. I'm sorry I can't be a good student. I'm sorry I'm not the girl you always wanted. I'm sorry I caused conflict with you and dad. And at the very end it was, I'm sorry I can't live anymore. And when she brought that to me, the first thing I did is say, okay, we're, everybody's going to therapy. 
we hadn't filed for divorce or anything, put a right smack into therapy. As the conflict escalated in the case, we had one attorney on the other side, it was just escalating the conflict, and it was getting worse and worse, and she ended up doing a couple of stints in your facility, and so helpful to her, so helpful. Thank you. Different Thank attorney you. got on, the settlement attorney, we got things calmed down, we got the case settled, and she's doing great now. Good. And Good at the know. time, it, uh, it was tragic. I mean, I looked at that little girl, and it, we sent her to equine therapy, we sent her to everything, because she was in such pain. And after she had spent a couple of minutes, and it didn't take the first time. She visited with y'all twice. Good. But, uh, but it was amazing well, I'm, I'm, the difference that's, in time. That's so, so I think it's, it's an organic approach to mm -hmm. the attorneys and the therapists and agencies like such as your own and the, the doctors working together to help us a little bit. Absolutely. So what, is the, what is the average treatment that your facility provides? The average treatment usually is about, um, as I mentioned, like the length of stay is variant. Kind of like usually it's about seven to maybe ten days. Usually the treatment is medication management by a psychiatrist. Usually there is um, like at least group therapy during the day, at least four of them, different dynamics. Could be expressive therapy, dynamic process. Um, they go to the gym and all that. And um, so mostly it is like that. In, in adolescence, we try to put more emphasis on the family as well. So there's a family therapy and all that. Um, unfortunately, we cannot force except when we're dealing with a patient to do family therapy, but sometimes you see a big red flag in the house and you cannot tell them you need to get your family therapy as well because they are lacking insight and lacking judgment and all that. And who's gonna pay at the end is gonna be his son. So hopefully at one point he's getting the insight to know, you know what, this is like a symptom of your own depression or symptom of your own um, maladaptive behavior. And if you get help, he will get that. So otherwise, you will continue to do this, and you will continue to drink, and he's going to continue to smoke, and all these things. So, thank you so much. I got a. Thank you.